from the beautiful mountains of Colorado comes the Gospel Truth Broadcast with Andrew Womack. Andrew has been called by God to be a teacher to the body of Christ. For the past 22 years, Andrew has been teaching people how to walk in God's best and is presently broadcasting the Gospel daily on over 30 radio stations nationwide. Let it flow, let it flow, let the Lord Andrew has distributed over one and a quarter million cassette tapes free of charge and is currently producing monthly installments of a New Testament study Bible with an accompanying cassette commentary called Life for Today. For more information about the ministry or to request a free cassette tape of today's message, please write to Andrew Womack, Post Office Box 3333, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80934. And now with today's message, here is Andrew Womack. Praise the Lord. This is Andrew Womack, and I welcome you to our Gospel Truth broadcast. On today's program, we are continuing our series. We've been teaching now on the subject of marriage, and we've been dealing with this. This will be our fifth tape in the series talking about marriage. And we've already covered a lot of uh, detail, a lot of information that is essential. We've been trying to renew our mind on God's perspective towards marriage. On our last teaching, and this is going to be a continuation of that, so I want to spend just a moment here summing up what we've talked about. But we were talking about strife. We were talking about the damaging effect that strife has on marriage. And we use basically as our main scripture on this, James chapter 3, verse 16. And that scripture says, Where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. And so that scripture says that if you allow strife into your marriage, then you are going to have every evil work come at you. That means that Satan has free hand. You may be resisting fine in the area of healing and believing God for uh, health in your body and you may have been confessing that and walking in it and yet if you're operating in strife, it's a direct inroad of Satan into your life. You cannot afford strife. I likened it to a snake that you wouldn't dare let a snake live in your house. Even though you may get by for a week or a month or a year without being bitten, you wouldn't allow something deadly like that just to live in your home. And yet people constantly allow strife in their home and don't even think about the effect that it's having on them. We need to wise up and recognize, just like the Scripture says in James 3.16, where envying and strife is, there's confusion and every evil work. Strife is a luxury that you cannot afford. And then we begin to talk about that some people think, well, I recognize that I shouldn't have it, but how do you get rid of it? I mean, after all, it's just my personality. I was born with a temper. You know, I've heard a lot of people say that, but that is not actually true. If, if you were born with a temper, if you literally came out angry at the world, then it had to be some kind of a demonic problem that you can cast that out of you. Anger is not a gene that's in your body that makes some people angry and others not so. It's not that at all. The scripture in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, and I want to go back to this scripture and start from here because this is an awesome scripture. God has used this in my life in a powerful way, and when I minister on this, people just cannot believe that the source of strife is this simple. Proverbs 13.10 says, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. That's the only way that strife comes is through pride. And we spent some time on our last program defining that pride is not just exalting yourself above measure, but pride can be debasing yourself. Pride is basically self-centeredness. It's thinking about self to the exclusion of everybody else or out of proportion. And it doesn't matter if you think that you're better than everybody else or if you think that you're worse than everybody else. Sometimes people who are beat down and feel totally inferior are actually very, very, very self-centered. Actually, I believe that, that thinking worse of yourself is a worse form of pride than exalting yourself. Because, for one thing, it's become uh, normal, it's become religious. Religion has actually taught us that you can't beat yourself down too much, but you can't exalt yourself too much. And so people have adopted this lifestyle where they just constantly put themselves down. But it's very, very, very self-centered. And so the reason that I'm bringing this out is some people think when the Scripture says only by pride comes contention, they think, well, I can't relate to that. But when you begin to start putting pride as self-centeredness, then I believe that every single person that's having problem with strife in their marriage can relate to this and can see the wisdom in this that this is exactly the reason that they're having problems. If we weren't so alive to ourself, 
then Satan would not be able to put strife in our life. It is not what other people do that makes you angry. It's what's inside of you that makes you react to other people's actions that make you angry. Jesus, of course, is a perfect example that even on the cross when he was crucified, he forgave those that crucified him, showing that another person's actions do not dictate your reaction. It's very important that you understand that. You know, I'm not a perfect example of this. I haven't arrived, but praise God, I've left. And I can see in my own life examples of this. One time I was pastoring a little tiny church, and uh, I had some people get on my case there, and they began to start criticizing me. And this one person in particular was an elder in the church, tried to run me out of the church, spent hours a day on the phone talking about me. I heard about it. I went and confronted him. We had quite an argument about it. He got really upset and just told me how little he thought of me. But did you know that I determined to walk in love with that guy? I recognized that it was Satan, not just fighting directly against me. The Bible says in Mark chapter 4, verse 18, that 17 and 18, that afflictions and persecutions come for the word's sake, to steal the word out of your heart. And I recognized that all of these insults that were being leveled weren't really at me. It was Satan trying to get me to back off of his word. And because of that, I just chose to love this guy, and I chose to forgive him. And the example that I'm wanting you to see is that the next week I went in to visit with this guy. I used to, every time I was by his place of business, just stop in and see him. And I went by to see him, walked in, and, you know, he was cool towards me. And I tried talking to him, and after about 10 minutes of that, it just wasn't working. And so I walked out, and I remember saying to my wife, I said, boy, something's wrong with him. He's just not treating me the way that he did before, and I couldn't understand it. And she just looked at me, first of all, startled, like, you've got to be kidding and then she said, don't you remember last week? Don't you remember the argument you had and all the things that he's been saying about you? And she couldn't believe that I didn't remember it. But see, this is an example of what I was talking about. I dealt with what was on the inside of me that made me so receptive to the hurt that other people gave, and I literally reached a place where I could forgive and forget, and it had no impact on me. Brothers and sisters, it is wrong to think that someone's actions made you do this. We have these sayings, well, the devil made me do it. It's a lie. The devil may have tempted you through somebody else. He may have given you an occasion by most people's standards, but the bottom line is you do not have to be angry unless you choose to be angry, regardless of what anybody has done to you. Well, I could stay on that for hours, and I think sometimes it needs to be drilled in, but I need to move on. I just really want you to let God speak this to you, that another person is not what your problem is. It's what's on the inside of us that makes us react to other people that causes the problem. And according to this scripture, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, it's the pride, the self-centeredness, the fact that we are thinking about everything only from our own perspective that causes this problem. You know, an example of what we're talking about is that a few years back, I was watching a thing on the television, and this documentary was against capital punishment. They were trying to uh, convince you that capital punishment wasn't good. Now, I'm not here to state my views on that, but just for the purpose of you understanding where I'm coming from, I believe that capital punishment is a godly deterrent. I'm not excited about it, but I believe that it's superior to the alternatives. And so I support capital punishment. But on this uh, program, they showed a man who was in a prison cell, death row, facing death. He had been there for a long period of time. And they zeroed in on him. They showed you hit the sadness that he was going through. I mean, the hard times, what he was thinking. And uh, as you looked at it, you couldn't help but feel kind of sorry for this guy. And then they went back to when he was a child. And they went back and showed him riding a little stick horse when he was two or three years old and playing. And, you know, a child is innocent. As you looked at that, you couldn't help but feel pity and think that, man, someday this guy's going to grow up to be on death row and facing execution. And the reason they went back and did that was to show you his side of the thing. And then by the time he was six or seven years old, his parents had sexually abused him. He had been cast out of their home. He lived with foster homes. And, and on and on the story went until by the time he came up to where he actually raped this woman and murdered her, even though you didn't approve of what he did, you couldn't help but feel sympathy and feel like, man, isn't there some other way? And I was looking at that, and I was being swayed. My emotions were being swayed in favor of this guy and against capital punishment. And I, as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, God, you know, I was, is this really right? And what the Lord spoke to me was, he says, if you were to take this same instance, and instead of showing the man's side of the story, show the girl. 
show her baby pictures, show how pure and innocent she was, and just develop a story how that she was growing up and maybe had plans of marrying somebody and all of these great plans. Maybe she was a Christian girl and on and on it goes. And then some pervert comes into his, uh, her life and because of his own sexual desires and gratification of self, he rapes her and then murders her trying to cover up what he had done. If you were to show that same thing to those same group of people that had seen his side of the story, those exact same people would turn into a vigilante committee and go out and try and hang the guy. And through that, the Lord showed me that it's your perspective, it's which side of the story you're looking on that determines your reaction. It is not what people do that makes you angry or makes you walk in love. It's a decision on the inside, what you choose to think upon. And brothers and sisters, the problem has been that, like this scripture has said, we have been self-centered. We've been thinking on how other people hurt us. And if that's the way, if you reference everything and look how they've treated me, well, then you're constantly going to feel like, I've got rights, I need to do this. But when you get into God's kind of love and begin to start looking at the other person and thinking more of the other person than you think of yourself, what will happen is it will totally diffuse strife. It is just as impossible for you to be in strife without being self-centered as it is impossible to be self-centered and not be in strife. Actually, the strife, the outward manifestation of anger, the arguments that people have, etc., that's not really the problem. It's the problem inside. Why are they so bitter? Why are they so angry on the inside? And it all comes because we're thinking about, look what somebody has done to me. You know, my brother and I are just uh, opposites in a lot of ways, and I'm the kind that ever since I was in high school, I've not had a problem. Uh, with really losing my temper. My wife can tell you that it's, I don't know if she's ever seen me angry. That doesn't mean that I don't have a temper. It just means that I'm the powder kind. I mean, somebody says something to me, I internalize it. I go to pouting and thinking about it, have these pity parties and nobody else ever shows up. Well, my brother's just the opposite. I remember when I was a kid, he'd get mad and uh, throw fits and hit people and do all kinds of things. And, you know, I remember that sometimes when my brother did that, and I mean, he just literally lost his temper and got angry, I've heard my brother come back dozens, if not hundreds of times, and tell me, you know, and say to other people, he says, I'm sorry, I didn't think about what I was doing. I didn't think about how I was going to hurt you or what I was saying. If I'd have thought of you, I wouldn't have done it. Now, he didn't always say it in those words, but that's basically what he was saying. And what he was doing was verifying Proverbs 13:10. Only by pride comes contention. A person who is angry is a person who is not thinking of the other person, but rather is thinking of themselves. Now, you can see this in a lot of instances, but Moses, he developed a humility with God to such a degree that when people came out against Moses, instead of thinking of the offense that they had given him, he immediately would think about that, uh-oh, these people are in trouble. They've spoken against God's anointing, and Moses would fall on his face and begin to pray and intercede for those people. Let me share one other scripture with you, and this ought to nail down for anybody who's having any questions about this, the problem of pride and what it really is. This is what it says in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 2. And uh, the background of this is that Miriam and Aaron, which were Moses' brother and sister, were criticizing him because he had married an Ethiopian woman, a black woman, and he himself wasn't black. They were criticizing him for that. In verse 2, they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. And then in parentheses, verse 3 says this, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. You know, that's an awesome statement. An awesome statement. He was the meekest man on the face of the earth. And the thing that makes this even more amazing is that Moses is the one who wrote this. I mean, now it's one thing to be meek, but it's another thing to say about yourself. I'm the meekest man on the face of the earth. See, to understand this, you've got to redefine humility. We say that a person, if they're really humble, will never say anything positive about themselves. They'll always beat themselves down. But how could Moses then, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, write that he was the meekest man on the face of the earth? See, true humility is just thinking about yourself what is right, not going above it or going below it. And if we will refuse to say something positive about ourselves because we're afraid somebody else may uh, misinterpret it or misapply it, then we're actually self-centered. See, mo if, if I was to take a, a contest right now and say, who's the meekest person listening to this? 
Did you know there has to be somebody out of all the people watching this that somebody is more meek than, than all the rest? If we were to pray and ask God to speak right now and show us who was really the mo most meek person in this entire audience, if God was to speak to you and say that it was you, would you be meek enough to actually say that it was you? See, you've got to redefine what true humility is. Moses had literally so emptied himself, he was so at God's disposal and so much in love with the people that he was trying to minister to that when people came out against him and criticized him, he just fell down and began to pray for them. Brothers and sisters, it's not what other people are doing that makes you angry. It's this self-centeredness on the inside of us. How come we're so self-centered? Well, just a real simple answer to this is that when you were born, you didn't come into this world thinking of other people. You came into this world thinking of yourself. You didn't think about the fact that your mother had just had a baby and that here she was, she'd been through this labor and through all of this effort, and here you are waking her up in the middle of the night. When you wanted to be fed, you cried. When you wanted to have your diaper changed, you cried. When you wanted anything, you cried, thinking about nobody else. We all came into this world 100% self-centered. Now, that's understandable when you're a month old. But the problem is when you get to be 40, 50, 60, 70 years old and you're still totally self-centered. One of the responsibilities of a parent is to train their children out of self-centeredness. And yet many times what we do is actually reinforce this self-centeredness. We've probably all seen kids at, in a supermarket or something, they're, they're wanting candy and their mother says, no, you can't have that, it's not good for you, you've already had some today. And the kid says, but I want it. And the mother says, no. And the kid begins to start throwing a fit, fall down in the aisle, scream, holler, yell. And you know what most parents will do? Most parents will give the child the thing that they've cried for. Why? Because the parent themselves is self-centered, and instead of thinking about what's best for the child, they're thinking about what's everybody going to think about me. Look at this brat and the way they're acting. And so out of motivation of self-centeredness, they give the child what they want and actually reinforce this self-centeredness, saying it worked. You got it. You can get whatever you want if you just want to scream and holler loud enough. And so most of us have actually had self-centeredness reinforced in us. We grow up and become totally self-centered and I'm saying this again, not to condemn, but I'm saying it to try and open up our eyes that the problem isn't your mate. Some of you know that. You've already on the second, third, fourth mate, and the same problems are still there. The problem isn't your mate. The problem is us, that we're self-centered, that we've never come out of that self-centeredness, and we are living and consuming everything totally upon ourselves. If that's your attitude, I promise you, according to this scripture in Proverbs 13:10. Strife is an inevitable byproduct. It's impossible. You couldn't live with anybody. You couldn't live with Jesus without getting in strife because I guarantee you even Jesus didn't just pet and stroke people all of the time. Sometimes you're going to do things that rub people the wrong way. And, and, of course, most of us are not living with a person living totally like Jesus. And I promise you, even if that person isn't out to get you, there's going to be times that you rub each other the wrong way. If you're self-centered, you're going to uh, automatically respond to this in strife. You know, there's an example of this, and again, I'm trying to hurry through this and not give too many details, but I had a lady one time who worked for me, one of my first employees, that was in a real serious marriage problem. When I first met her, she was out on the front lawn of her house. The police were separating her and her husband, and her husband had tried to kill her and her two children that night. She was a white woman married to a black man, and this was her second marriage. She came into this marriage because she met this man in a store and she had never seen him before and he was operating under the power of Satan and he said, your name is, told her her name and told her all about her and says, I'm God. If you'll worship me, I can solve your problems. She wasn't born again and she fell for it, married this guy thinking that he was God and actually worshiped him as God. So that's the situation that she was in. And she had two children by the previous marriage who were white children, and he hated them and made them stay in the basement, and if they ever came out of the basement, he threatened to kill them. And she had, he had broken her neck one time before, beaten her. He had thrown hot grease on her, all of these kind of things. And this night, he had tried to kill those two children, and so the police were standing in between them. The people who brought her to me or brought me to her were wanting me as a minister to tell her that, hey, she didn't have to live with this jerk. She could get up and leave. And so anyway, I quoted 1 Corinthians chapter 7 to her that if the unbelieving mate is pleased to dwell with you, then don't leave. Stay with them. And I said, it doesn't sound to me like he's pleased to dwell with you. You're free to go. 
And everybody, you know, was excited, said, Amen. But then what I did was turn and says, But you don't have to leave. And this lady just in shock looked at me and I said, It's only the devil in him that makes him the way he is. And I said, He that's in you is greater than he that's in the world. And I said, You can't necessarily change him, but you can change what's on the inside of you that makes you so fearful and so under his dominion. I said, I guarantee if I lived in that home, he wouldn't be able to get away with it. I would not allow the devil in him to run my life and to do those things. And this woman, God just opened her heart, and it was a long period of time. It took a year, but she began to start really believing for her husband. And she began to apply these exact things that I've been teaching you about pride and about strife. And she began to say, God, what makes him the way he is? And look on his side of the thing. How come he's so messed up? And she went back and saw from his childhood that really this guy had never really had a fair shake. And God, through this, gave her a supernatural love for that man so that they begin to start seeing this strife in their marriage overcome. And just one example of it was that they went to a marriage counselor, and this marriage counselor uh, called them in. Uh, the man could quote most of the New Testament. He was a deacon in the Baptist church, which I'm not saying that to put down any denomination. He just was, and he wasn't born again. He was into uh, levitating tables. He would leave his body at night and go bark at the moon and scratch on the wall and yet his body would still be laying beside this woman in bed. Uh, he called up spirits, communicated with spirits. He was into all of this stuff, and yet he had this facade of being a Christian, could quote lots of scriptures. So they went to this Christian marriage counselor, and this counselor uh, started with the man and asked him his side of the story. And the man began to start giving it, and what he did was tell everything that he had done to the woman. He transferred it to the woman, and he said, she beats me, she's broken my neck, she's poured hot grease on me, She's done all of these things. She leaves her body in, barks at the moon. She levitates tables. He lied and did all of this stuff. And he totally uh, convinced that marriage counselor. And this marriage counselor, after hearing his side of the story, was so irate that before he even heard the woman's side of the story, he turned to him and he says, Man, you do not have to live with that. You can divorce this woman. You can get away from that. God does not expect you to have to put up with that. And then he turned to the woman and says, What's your side of the story? And here's what I wanted you to get. This woman had so dealt with herself, she had reached a place to where she knew that God loved her. And she was content and secure that she told that man, the marriage counselor, she says, well, you know, I used to fault him and he was my whole problem, but God has shown me that I'm just as much a part of the problems in this marriage as he is. And I've got all of these things. God has been revealing to me how I haven't been loving towards him. I haven't submitted. I haven't respected him. And she just started listing all of the things that she had done wrong. Didn't counter a single one of the accusations that the man gave. And did you know after hearing that, the marriage counselor says, no reason to come back. This marriage is irreparable. Forget it and just leave. And did you know that when they got out of there, this man turned to his wife, totally shocked, and he said, how come you didn't tell them the truth? Why didn't you tell them that it was me that had done all of those kind of things? And what this woman said to the man was, says, I didn't come here to get me helped. God's already helped me. I came here to get you help. And if running me down is going to help you, that's fine. And she didn't say that sarcastically trying to manipulate him. She was saying it really from her heart that self, see, was so dealt with that this man could lie about her, slander her, do all kinds of things. And yet, it didn't affect her because, see, pride had been dealt with. Boy, that's tremendous. And brothers and sisters, that attitude, did you know it so shook that man? He recognized that what was happening in his wife was not just natural, that it was the power of God. That man came under such conviction that he lost all of his powers. And he got terrified of this woman. He literally said that he had lost his power to levitate these tables to communicate with the spirits. And this man, in terror, fled from that house, separated himself from that woman, and moved out for a period of six months. And during this time period, the woman just used that time to get her and her children built up in the Lord, played music and tapes and things like that, kept praying for the man. He eventually moved back in, and I left the area during that time frame. But since then, I've heard that he was born again. He's now pastoring a church. And the strife that they've had in the home during the last few years is that he's wanted to go to Bible school and she wouldn't let him. She didn't want him to do it. So, brothers and sisters, the point that I'm saying is a situation that would make most of your marriages look like it's, a, a, you know, no problem at all in comparison was resolved by one person 
not trying to change the other person, but instead changing themselves, the bitterness, the hurt, the anger, and by most people's standards, justified anger that they had. But see, it's not what other people do that makes you angry. It's what's on the inside of you. That woman could not change her husband, but she could change herself. And because she changed herself, then she was able to operate in God's kind of love towards that man. Did you know you do not have absolute control over your mate? There are some of you that have spent great amount of time and effort, energy, praying for God to straighten out your mate. And it goes back to that saying that Jesus used in Matthew, the seventh chapter. Why are you trying to cast this little speck out of someone else's eye when you got this own beam out of your own eye? Brothers and sisters, God did not call you to be the Holy Ghost to your mate. You can't do that. That's not your job. But what you can do is deal with yourself. You can deal with this pride on the inside. And it's not a simple process. I've presented the, the problem and I've simplified it, but it is not simple to overcome. It's one of the hardest things you're ever going to do to begin to start dealing with self and humbling it. And I tell you, it takes a miracle from God. It is not just a one-time shot. You don't just pray and one time get it over with. It has to be a continual process of God working in your life. But you have to begin somewhere. Today could be the day that you begin. You could start right now by saying, God, forgive me for blaming my mate. Forgive me for thinking that other people are my problem, justifying my anger. And God, forgive me for my own self-centeredness that has been the cause of my pride, that has been the cause of this strife. And you could ask God right now to come into your life and begin to do a work. You could humble yourself. The Bible says you humble yourself and God will lift you up. God's not going to knock you down and take this from you. You have to voluntarily say, God, come in. God, take away my pride. And you have to do it through personal relationship with the Lord. This isn't going to happen if you don't establish a good personal relationship with the Lord. So I encourage you today to take this as a word from the Lord. Let God deal with the pride in your life and strife will cease. I know that this teaching today has ministered to you and all of us have this pride on the inside that actually gives strife an opportunity in our life. I'd like to encourage you to write in and get this cassette tape that I have on the subject of strife. It's the same tape that we made on our program on the last program, but it is an invaluable tool in being able to overcome strife in your life. You can request it by simply asking for our tape offer, TF13. That's tape offer, TF13, and we'll send it to you through the mail. We do request that you help us financially, but we send these tapes out regardless of your financial response. So if you can give, give, but most importantly of all, write in and request this tape offer on strife. From the beautiful mountains of Colorado comes the Gospel Truth Broadcast with Andrew Womack. Andrew has been called by God to be a teacher to the body of Christ. For the past 22 years, Andrew has been teaching people how to walk in God's best and is presently broadcasting the Gospel daily on over 30 radio stations nationwide. Let it flow, let it flow, let the love Andrew has distributed over one and a quarter million cassette tapes free of charge and is currently producing monthly installments of a New Testament study Bible with an accompanying cassette commentary called Life for Today. For more information about the ministry or to request a free cassette tape of today's message, please write to Andrew Womack, Post Office Box 3333, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80934. And now with today's message, here is Andrew Womack. Praise the Lord. I'm Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you've joined me today for our Gospel Truth broadcast. This is our sixth teaching in a series on marriage, and we have covered a tremendous amount of material. We've been talking about from Genesis chapter 2 
about the uh, purpose of marriage, what God created it for, and it wasn't to make you happy. It wasn't to do a lot of things that people look to marriage for. We're supposed to get that directly from God. But rather, it's for, of course, procreation, but then uh, the other aspect of it is it's to give us a power of agreement. There's a power that's released in marriage, and we spent quite a bit of time talking about unity. And then we talked about the priority that marriage was supposed to take over all other relationships, over any other interest. And we spent two sessions talking about strife in marriage, how deadly it was, how we cannot afford it, how it is not just normal. You weren't just born with a temper. It's an acquired thing. And specifically out of Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, the scripture says, only by pride comes contention. And we define pride there as being self-centeredness, not only thinking you're better than everybody else, but it could be a person that thinks you're worse than everybody else. Either extreme is still self-centeredness, and that's the way that strife comes into marriage. You cannot control the other person in your marriage. You can influence them, but you cannot control them. And a lot of people run into frustration in marriage because they're constantly trying to take the promises of God's Word and control their mate and make their mate a certain way. That's not what the Word of God teaches. You can't control other people. What you can do is deal with the things on the inside of you that makes you respond so angrily to the things that they do. And we've given a lot of examples of that. Of course, the Scriptures show Jesus Himself able to forgive the very people who were crucifying Him, which He's our perfect example. And brothers and sisters, we can live above strife. And so that's what we were teaching on. Basically, the antidote for this self-centeredness is God's kind of love. And that's what I want to share with you today, talking about God's kind of love in marriage. And I really believe that there is a need to clarify God's kind of love because people today say, well, I understand that, you know, love has to be in marriage. Uh, in the secular world, even, people constantly are singing songs and talking about love in marriage. But what most people today call love doesn't even come close to resembling God's kind of love according to the Scripture. People today will say things like, I love God, I love my wife, I love my dog, and I love ice cream, all in the same paragraph. And I hope that uh, we love our dog differently than we love our wife. There's supposed to be a different kind of love. The Greek language that the New Testament was written in has uh, four different words that it uses for love. And without me going into a detailed study on that, I'm just saying that there are different types of love. Our language uh, lumps a lot of things together when it talks about love. But there are different kinds of love. And there is a God kind of love that is different than what most of us have experienced. Actually, most of us don't really acknowledge that a God kind of love exists. And certainly in our relationship with our mate, many of us may be thinking, well, I love them, but we aren't loving them the way that God loves. And so we've got to clarify what God's kind of love is all about. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And this is what a lot of people call the love chapter in the Bible. It's right sandwiched in between 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, which is talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And it, the purpose of it being here is simply to show that the power of God, all of the manifestations of the power of God, are useless if it, doesn't, if it isn't motivated by God's kind of love. And we could make many, many applications of this directly to the subject of marriage. That it doesn't matter what else you get. It doesn't matter any of the techniques that you develop, whatever you learn about marriage. Everything you do is totally useless if you don't have God's kind of love in it. I teach marriage seminars in this series that we're doing on marriage right here. Uh, you'll notice that I'm not going to teach a, se a session on communication, and that's not because I don't believe it's important to com uh, not important to communicate. I believe it's a necessity. That's one of the problems that marriages have. But actually, communication is a byproduct of, uh, first of all, a good relationship. If you've got hatred in your heart and all you do is learn how to communicate, well, you'll communicate hatred. The Bible says in, in Matthew chapter 12, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if your heart is full of hatred and you learn all of these communication skills, all you're going to do is communicate problems. So we're dealing kind of with the symptom when we deal with communication. And again, that's not to say that there isn't a need once you get your heart straightened out to learn how to begin to start communicating and sharing what's in your heart. But the reason I deal with these kind of things is because if you can go directly to the root of the problem, if you can deal with the love or the lack of love in your heart for your mate, 
Communication will be an inevitable byproduct of it. Everything will work. Just as the gifts of the Spirit, all of these manifestations work out of love. A scripture that goes along with this is Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, and that scripture says that faith works by love. As much teaching as there is in the Word of God on the subject of faith, some people have tried to zero in on faith, grab the uh, knowledge about faith, the seven steps to faith, and all of these other techniques, and have just tried to manipulate and work faith as a mechanical thing, and they failed at it. They're discouraged, they're frustrated, and they wind up getting bitter and, and actually turning on faith and say it didn't work. It's not that faith doesn't work, but see, faith has to be motivated out of love. Faith is actually a byproduct of love. If you have a good love relationship, you'll trust and believe in that person. And so that's what the scripture says, faith works by love. Well, the same thing is true about uh, all of the gifts of the Spirit and marriage and everything else. Everything comes out of this relationship of love. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, the scripture says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, and this word charity is an old English word that the King James translator used, and actually it's a, it's a very, very good word. Today it's kind of lost some of its meaning, and we think of charity as something like uh, Salvation Army or Goodwill, but the reason that, that uh, charity has been attributed to organizations like that because the true definition, the definition that was in use at the time that the translation was made is it's talking about a specific kind of love, a God kind of love that expresses itself in attitudes and actions towards other people. It's talking about brotherly love. And over in 1 John chapter 4, the scripture there says that if you say that you love God and yet don't love your brother, then you're a liar and the truth isn't in you. So one of the ways, of, uh, one of the acid tests of are you operating in God's kind of love is how is your relationship to people? If your relationship with people is straight, then you can say that your relationship with God is straight, but not until then. You know, actually in the area of marriage, uh, I say this kind of hesitantly because some people really get condemned by this, but it's a true statement. If this convicts you, then you just need to change. Uh, it's kind of like, I use this example that if you pet a cat, you know, and you rub the hair and you go against grain so that all of the hair stands up, you know how to solve that problem? Well, you just turn the cat around and keep petting. And what happens is all that hair lays down. So if what I'm saying rubs you the wrong way, all you got to do is repent, turn around, it'll go to feeling good. But the point that I was making is that really there is no better reflection of your relationship with God than your relationship with your mate. That's the closest relationship that we have. And if that is not good, then it's a reflection on our relationship with God. And that does need to be qualified to this extent that when I'm saying your relationship with your mate needs to be good, some mates are not born again. They aren't even trying to make this relationship work. And so there may be problems, but I'm saying how are you responding to those problems? Is there bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, all of these kind of things? Or are you walking in love? If you can walk in love with your mate, whether they're walking in love with you or not, then I believe that that is a sign of, of a positive relationship with the Lord. And that's what this scripture is saying. If you have the uh, tongues of men and of angels and don't have God's kind of love, you're nothing but sound and brass and a tinkling cymbal. Now, we can talk about a thousand things that concern marriage, and there's a lot of things that we are going to be dealing with. But this is important. I'm trying to establish the importance of this, that God's kind of love is the only way to make marriages work. God is the one that created marriage, and he created marriage for a sinless, perfect man. He never intended for man to operate independent of him. He never intended for man to operate without God's kind of love flowing through him. We were made to be beings created in God's image and to let the love and the life of God flow through us. And if a person isn't walking in God's kind of love, marriage was never intended to operate that way. So this is something that we must get hold of. It's an essential. And I encourage you to really let these words minister unto you. In verse 2, he says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. I want to encourage you. Some of you have been trying to release your faith, praying for your mate, praying for that marriage to prosper, and yet you yourselves aren't walking in love towards your mate. Faith is not a substitute for love. Matter of fact, if you go to the very last verse in this chapter, it says, Now about a faith, hope, and charity, or God's kind of love, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. 
Charity is even greater force than faith. Some of you, if you'd take half the faith you're exerting towards your mate and begin to start loving them with that same intensity, would see a tremendous amount of change come to pass in the marriage. In verse 3, it says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, God's kind of love, it profits me nothing. Again, many of us have substituted other things. I, I know that I've seen people before that they neglected their family because of jobs, because of other things, especially in the area of children. Uh, men are away trying to make a living, and they try and substitute by giving their kids things. But I tell you, a thing is a sorry substitute for a parent. Things are a sorry substitute for a husband or for a wife. It's not just providing a house. It's not just providing a standard of living. It's got to be God's kind of love that cannot be measured by tangible things. It has to be an expression of yourself. If you don't have that, you're nothing. And I know that some of the things I'm saying may be very convicting. This is kind of serious stuff. But I tell you, we've got to hit the nerve and show you where the problem is. He begins in verse 4 to begin defining what God's kind of love is like. In verse 4, he says, Charity, or God's kind of love, suffers long and is kind. Now, we're going to go through this list, and this is basically just a description of what God's kind of love is like. And the reason I want to go through this is, first of all, to show you that many of us think, well, I really do love my mate, and I've loved them, I've done all of this, and it just isn't working. God's kind of love works. And one of the things we've got to do is to analyze, make sure, is this really God's love we're operating in, or are we operating in the type of love that the world operates in, where I'll love you as long as you love me. Now again, see, Jesus is God's greatest expression of love, and Jesus operated in a love where he loved people that didn't love him. I've used this example many times already in this series. But Jesus loved the very people who were crucifying him. He said, Father, forgive them. Now see, that's a God's kind of love. that doesn't have to have actions on the other person's part that solicit this kind of response. God's kind of love is just a decision that you make from your heart. It is not a reaction. And what most people are operating in today is an emotional type of love that as long as you stroke me and make me feel good, then I love it. I appreciate it. But the moment you cease to be a blessing to me and give me what I want, then all of a sudden this love has gone out of our life. All that's happened is you've quit feeding me and my emotions have changed. But see, that's not God's kind of love. God's kind of love goes far, far, far beyond emotions. This very first thing right here in verse 4, it says that God's kind of love suffers long and is kind. We could literally spend hours on this one point. You know, in marriages, if we were just suffered with each other, in other words, if we were patient with the other person in kind, that would stop a tremendous amount of problem right there. You know, I've had people come to me for marriage counseling, and I sit down and and uh, the type of person I am, I'm kind of blunt and to the point. I don't want to take 15 sessions to get to the root of the problem. I depend on the Holy Ghost to show me things. And most of the time when people come to me with marriage problems, they really don't know what the problem is. If they knew what the problem is, it'd be easy to fix. They think their they're mate's their problem or something else. So I can't just take what they say. God speaks to me, and I break in, and I, I just am real blunt with people and tell them things. And I remember this one counseling session that I had. And in this session, this husband and wife were just about to have a fight with each other while they were there. And I just began to start operating under the direction of God. And I started telling this man especially some things. And I remember telling him that, you know, really, I said, I'm not saying this to hurt you, but you're just acting like a jerk in this marriage. And I began to start being real blunt, telling him things that he was doing. And did you know the reaction of this guy to me? I mean, I could tell that it offended him, but yet he calmed himself, he restrained himself, and he even tried to be nice about it. And he says, well, I, I accept what you're saying. And he began to humble himself, and he says, I'm going to try and change. And you know what I did with that? I said, here I am, basically a total stranger. You've heard about me, but you don't really know me. You come into a session like this, you allow me to say things like that to you, and you're kind to me. You suffer with me, even though I say things that offend you. I say, what would have happened if your wife would have said that exact same thing to you. And boy, I mean, his eyes got big, and he just he told me he would have exploded. That's exactly what she has said in the past. And then I turned around to the wife, and I said the same thing. I said, what if your husband was to say some of the things to you that I've said to you during this counseling session? What kind of reaction would you get? And instantly she says, well, man, we've fought over things just like this. 
The point that I'm making through that is that somehow we've adopted this double standard to where we actually treat strangers better than we treat the very person that we live with, the person that's supposed to be the most important person in our life. We many times treat them worse than we treat other people, people at work, just acquaintances. You know, my brother, again, is I use him as an example sometimes, but my brother, when he first got married, he's... Uh, got some things that he's very opinionated about and one of them was that at just a few weeks after they were married his wife uh, had some company coming over and she was setting the table and she was getting out the crystal and she was getting out the china and all the fancy silverware all of these kind of things setting the table and my brother came in and says what are you doing and she says well we got company coming over so i'm putting out all of our good stuff he gathered it up put out the other stuff and he says we'll use the china and stuff for my family and he says we'll use the other stuff for friends and that was just a kind of a symbolic gesture. But, you know, my brother really has put an importance on his family. He really does give a tremendous amount of importance. He treats his family better than he treats other people. And, you know, that's the way that we all ought to be. And yet many of us have adopted a double standard to where we feel like our mate, it's just part of the territory. They have to learn how to put up with everything we feel. We treat them rude. We don't prepare ourselves, fix ourselves up for our mates, which... You know, I know that you can't live constantly with, uh, you know, like you just stepped out of a movie studio, but I'm saying that we ought to give a priority to trying to minister to our family. The very first thing that God's kind of love is, God's kind of love suffers long and it's kind. Did you know if we would just go out of our way to begin to start being kind, saying something kind to your mate, did you know that that would solve a lot of problems? Much of the turmoil in marriage comes because we just feel neglected. We don't feel appreciated. And it comes because we treat everybody else kinder than we treat our own mates. And, you know, God has had to deal with me on this because uh, when my wife and I got married, I adopted a mentality that we were one. And I looked at her as being myself. And did you know that I actually would uh, a lot rather suffer wrong myself than to do wrong to somebody else? If somebody imposes on me, I'd rather just go ahead and suffer the uh, problem and not offend them or do anything. And that's the way that I am. And because I considered my wife as a part of myself, I wound up sliding my wife, sliding my family sometimes, uh, just because I looked at them and treated at them so much like myself that I actually uh, slided them sometimes. And the Lord dealt with me and told me that I needed to treat my wife better than that. I needed to treat my wife better than I was treating myself. And, you know, I've, I'm still adjusting I, I won't say that I've got this all worked out yet, but I am constantly trying to just be kind to my wife and to my kids. I've caught myself sometimes, you know, your kids do the same thing over and over and over, and sometimes your patience is tried, this long-suffering. And I wind up just saying, you know, how many times do I have to tell you? And yet I say things to them that I wouldn't say to other people, and the Lord's had to deal with me, and I have to go back and treat my children with the same respect that I'd treat other people. You know, many of you may get convicted. You may not even like some of the things that I say, and yet you would be polite to me, and yet you talk to your children in ways that if you were to speak that way to me, I guarantee you I'd be offended. You would not have any questions at all if I got angry with you, and you, you wouldn't wonder, why is he like that? If you talk to me the way you talk to your children or the way you talk to your wife, the point that I'm trying to say is the very first qualification are characteristic of God's kind of love. Many of us are failing dramatically in this. And then we wonder why we're having problems. The problems are because we aren't walking in God's kind of love. God's kind of love is the glue. It's the semen or the mortar that makes marriages stay together. It's the thing that allows us to overcome these personality problems. And when you're living with another person, you're going to have the other person rub you the wrong way. Even if they really love you and if they intend to do good, eventually you are just going to have somebody go opposite to what you want because they're different personalities. And if you don't have God's kind of love, you'll never be able to smooth over those kind of things. God's kind of love is a necessity, and we're missing it in nearly every one of these characteristics given for God's kind of love. If you see yourself falling short in one of these areas, don't get condemned, get convicted. The reason I'm doing this is this ought to serve as a red flag waving in your face every time you begin to start being short-tempered, impatient, saying, man, how long are they going to continue to do this? How long do I have to put up with this? Every time you have an emotion like that, 
it ought to be a red flag going up that, uh-oh, I'm not operating in God's kind of love. God's kind of love suffers long and is kind. Every time you see yourself beginning to start saying something that you wouldn't say to somebody else, and that's not to say that there's not a time to be frank and open and even to say things that may not be received well, but the way you discern between that is what's your motive? Are you saying it to get even? Are you saying it because you've been hurt and you're trying to strike back in vengeance? Are you saying it really motivated out of love because they've got to see it and your heart's pure? Now, see, if you can say it that way, well, then it's okay to bring up some things like that. But a lot of what we're doing is just literally venting our own frustrations and saying things that we wouldn't say to anybody else. That's not being kind, and that is not God's kind of love. The second thing that it says here is that God's kind of love envieth not. A scripture that we were using on our last teaching in James chapter 3, verse 16, it says where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Envy is self-centeredness. All of these characteristics of God's kind of love could probably be summed up. If you had to come up with one phrase that would sum them all up is you could say that God's kind of love is not self-centered. It doesn't seek its own. God's kind of love is other people-centered. The world's love is all self-centered. What can I get out of it? Did you know that most marriages did not start with God's kind of love? You didn't go to a person who you saw and you said, man, this is a person that I can totally give myself to, that I can pour myself into, but rather you saw a person that you thought was going to minister to you. You saw a person that you could see all of these attributes that it would make you happy and all of these things, and you actually, most of us, were motivated to marry the person that we married out of a selfish, self-centered kind of love. It does not conform to these attributes of God's kind of love right here. Now, the reason I'm saying this is to show us that many of us have started our marriage on the wrong foot. We've started it on a love that is based on how well that person performs. And I can promise you this, that it doesn't matter who you're married to, their performance is not going to be perfect. You're going to wind up being disappointed, and if your love is based on their performance, if it's based on all that they can do for you, eventually that kind of love is going to sour. You've got to get to, into God's kind of love where it isn't self-centered. It doesn't envy. It doesn't think about self. You aren't in it just for yourself. You know, m many people, when they get married, they, uh, the wife picked the man who is the Mr. All-American. I mean, he was the captain of the football team. He had this gorgeous, wavy head of hair and all of these things. And then a few years down the road, see, when when he's lost his hair, when he's gotten the Dunlop disease, that's where your belt is Dunlopped over your belt buckle. Or you get the chest or drawers disease, that's where your chest is done dropped down into your drawers. <laughs> and when things like that happen, all of a sudden, see, they say, I'm losing the love in my marriage. Well, what it was, it wasn't God's kind of love. It was a love based on how well they looked. And the man picks the homecoming queen and he wants everybody to envy him as he walks down the street saying, oh man, what a gorgeous wife he's got. See, it was a self-centered motivation that many of us operated in. And that's the reason that we're having problems. Going back again to that teaching that I gave out of uh, James 3.16, coupled with Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, only by pride comes contention. That's the only way. Self-centeredness. If we're operating in a self-serving kind of love that loves that person when they're loving us and when they're giving to us, then you're going to be disappointed. That kind of love will not stand the test. And brothers and sisters, there's many of you listening to me right now that you think, well, I just don't have love for my mate. I've lost it. All you've lost is that human type of love that was based on how well that person performs. And after living with them for a while and seeing their bad performance, you've lost that because now the bubble has been popped and you know that they are not this person that maybe you envisioned them to be when you got married. But see, God's kind of love can overlook those kind of things. God, it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the way that Jesus' love is. He loved you even when you were a sinner. He didn't love you because you were worth loving. He loved you because God is love. And see, when you're operating in God's kind of love, you can turn around and love that mate even when they don't deserve to be loved, even when they're doing things contrary to what is ministering to you. It's not ministering to you in a positive way, but rather a negative way. See, God's kind of love can still love in a situation like that. So the first thing you've got to do is to confront and recognize that, hey, what I thought was love 
was not really God's kind of love. As we continue to go through this list, you'll see some things in this list. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. You'll see some things here that I believe will convict you and let you recognize that you haven't really tried love. You haven't really used God's kind of love in that marriage or you would be thinking that it's working. When you employ God's kind of love and apply it to that mate, I guarantee you God's kind of love, according to verse 8, never fails. God's kind of love will bring a change not only in you but also in your mate as you begin to operate in God's kind of love. So take this list right here. Go through it, and if you see things in here that are not consistent with your actions, instead of trying to discredit God's word and say, does it really mean that? Instead, humble yourself and change yourself and say, Father, help me to operate in the kind of love that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talks about. I'd like to offer you a cassette tape that will go into this same subject, talking about God's kind of love in marriage. This is a 90-minute teaching cassette it's the first part in a two-part series talking about God's kind of love in marriage, and it's a gift to you if you'll simply write in and request my tape offer, TF11. That's tape offer, TF11. When you write in, this is a gift to you. It'll be sent regardless of your financial response, but I would like to ask you to pray about helping us financially to continue these programs. That's the way that God meets our needs. This tape will be a blessing to you, and I really encourage you to get it because it'll go into much more detail than what we were able to do on this program. Remember to request our tape offer, TF11. From the beautiful mountains of Colorado comes the Gospel Truth Broadcast with Andrew Womack. Andrew has been called by God to be a teacher to the body of Christ. For the past 22 years, Andrew has been teaching people how to walk in God's best and is presently broadcasting the Gospel daily on over 30 radio stations nationwide. Andrew has distributed over one and a quarter million cassette tapes free of charge and is currently producing monthly installments of a New Testament study Bible with an accompanying cassette commentary called Life for Today. For more information about the ministry or to request a free cassette tape of today's message, please write to Andrew Womack, Post Office Box 3333, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80934. And now with today's message, here is Andrew Womack. Praise the Lord. I'm Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you're with me again for another Gospel Truth broadcast. We're doing a series now on the subject of marriage. This is our seventh tape in the series dealing with marriage. And we've been talking about all different aspects of marriage. We started off talking about the real purpose that God created marriage for. And He created marriage not just to produce happiness in your life. He created marriage for a man who was already happy, who was sinless. He created marriage basically for the power of agreement, for the unity. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about that and about just the importance that marriage was intended to have in your life. Then we talked about the priority, how that no other relationship should come above it, that it ought to be the most important relationship or thing in your life. We also dealt with strife in marriage, which I believe to be one of the pivotal issues. Uh, most people recognize that there's strife in their marriage and yet they don't recognize how deadly it is. And also we dealt with what is the root cause of strife in your marriage, which according to Proverbs chapter 13 verse 10 is pride. Your words and motivation You helped me 
have changed my life with your words and motivation. You helped me to become a better person. I feel so great about your love. Never felt that before. Your words and motivation. You helped me to become a better person. I feel so great about your love. Never felt that before. You have changed my life with your words and motivation. So great about your love. Never felt that before. You are not only good by heart, but you also have a good soul. I'm lucky to find someone as wonderful as you are. I am so. Self-centeredness. That's the only thing that brings strife into your marriage. It's not your mate. It's not what they do. It's what's inside of us that makes us react to other people that causes strife. And I tell you, that was a very important teaching. And then on our last teaching, we begin to start sharing about the antidote for strife, the only thing that can ever overcome this self-centeredness that makes us so receptive to strife is God's kind of love. And we're dealing out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. On our last program, we began to deal with this, and we were only into part of this list of the characteristics of God's kind of love. And I want to go back to that again today and just make sure that we identify that what we're calling love is God's kind of love. You know, most people really don't have a good understanding of God's kind of love, and they aren't able to distinguish between God's kind of love and an earthly or a human type of love. There's a lot of people that when I deal with them, they say, well, I love my wife. I love my husband. I've already tried that, and love isn't enough. Well, these scriptures here, especially verse 8, where it says God's kind of love never fails. When we really apply God's kind of love, it does not fail. It does work. And I just want to encourage you with this list. This is kind of a checklist so that we can see, are we really operating in God's kind of love? And I can promise you that there's not a one of us that's going to come out 100% in this list. Now, there's a number of things to accomplish, but one of the first things is we've got to recognize that we have not exhausted God's kind of love yet in our marriage. And you've got to recognize that so that you won't feel like, well, I've already tried that and it didn't work. God's kind of love works. Out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, we've already talked about God's kind of love suffers long or it's patient and it's kind. God's kind of love is not envious, and we dealt with that on our last program. It goes on to say that God's kind of love vaunteth not itself, or in other words, it does not boast. 
It doesn't exalt itself. It is not puffed up. It doesn't operate in pride. And again, this is exactly what we were dealing with from Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, that only by pride comes contention. The only way we can deal with that self-centeredness in our life is God's kind of love. God's kind of love is a selfless type of love. It does not look out for number one. And, you know, again, I say I'm going to try and hurry through this on this program, but I, we could expand on this to such a degree that uh, it, it just would take hours to go through this. I'm praying that you would really ask God to take these few things we're saying and expand on it in your heart. But did you know our self-centeredness is the... It's like a beachhead of Satan in our life. It's a way that he gains control in so many areas. And when we're talking about marriage, there is no solution for marriage that doesn't uh, include us dealing with our own personal life, our own self-centeredness. We've got to deal with that before we're going to see anything come to pass. And this is exactly what God's kind of love. When you get into God's kind of love, it makes you selfless. It makes you to where you love the other person. You're actually thinking about somebody else more than you're thinking about yourself. And that is one of the biggest keys in marriage. You know, when we got married, most of us didn't start out with God's kind of love. We didn't find a person and say, you know, where's a person that I can pour my life into? Where's a person that I can really give and help make that person complete? But instead, it was a selfish, motivated thing. Where's the person that's going to make me what I want to be? Who's the person that I can draw from them and fulfill all of the needs in my life? Now, there's part of that in marriage. There is this unity, and we dealt with that already. But really, we ought to go into marriage with a selfless God kind of love. If that doesn't exist, then we've got to deal with this area. And brothers and sisters, this is precisely the reason that so many marriages are having problems is because we are in that marriage for what we can get out of it. The Lord said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And all of us have heard that terminology, and yet very few people really believe it or operate in it. But it is the truth. And to make your marriage work, You've got to get to a place to where you're a giver and not a receiver. You've got to get to a place to where you are not exalting yourself, not boasting in yourself, constantly talking about your accomplishments, operating in pride and putting down your mate. Boy, we could spend a lot of time just making application. Let me move on. In verse 5, it says that it does not behave itself unseemly. You know, I think that this is a very good characteristic of God's kind of love. I, I remember one instance in particular where there was this woman in our church who came to us and she said that she just loved this boy who was a lot younger than her. Matter of fact, she was his high school teacher. He was still in high school. But they really loved each other and, and so they came to us and talked about getting married. And I didn't know exactly what to tell her, but I remember one time that there was like 15 or 20 of us that went out to eat at a restaurant. And as we were at this restaurant, we all walked in, sat down, and they weren't even officially engaged. You know, it wasn't anything that was official. And yet, when we walked in and sat down, other people sat beside this woman. And this boy was not able to sit right beside her. And he got so upset that he couldn't control himself. He went outside and was pouting. And this girl had to excuse herself, go out there, calm him down, come back in, ask somebody to move and make place because he just loved her so much he couldn't stand to be apart from her for any time at all. And when I saw that, now see, some people may look at this and say, well, man, you know, they just must really love each other. No, that's not God's kind of love. Here's a characteristic. God's kind of love does not behave itself unseemly. That means it doesn't operate without tact or in an, an unbecoming manner. God's kind of love is something that can be controlled. It does not just control and possess us. Now, see, again, most people have a wrong conception of love. What they're actually talking about is lust. We see these examples where somebody's just walking down the street and they see this woman and all of a sudden they just get this overwhelming passion for her and they can't control themselves. And many of us have been led to believe that, man, that's love. It just came upon him. No, that's lust. God's kind of love is not that way. We'll be dealing with this more as we go on and define it. But this scripture here gives a characteristic that God's kind of love does not behave itself unseemly. It'll never embarrass you. As I looked up the Greek words on this, one of the definitions of this is that God's kind of love will never cause you to blush is what it's talking about. God's kind of love is, it's a gentleman. It doesn't do things like that. So when you see somebody that just says, well, they've got this overwhelming passion, their emotions are into it, they literally cannot control themselves, that ought to be a red flag that, hey, this is not God's kind of love. Now, there's a lot of applications. I'll be making some more on this later. But, you know, in the uh, sexual relationship in marriage, I can think of some examples of people that are having problems in that area 
And sometimes one of the partners will just say that they literally cannot control themselves, that they've got this tremendous physical drive and passion for their mate. And they wind up doing things that are not agreeable to the other mate. And I've dealt with some couples like that, and they'll come back and say, but I just love her. I cannot control myself. Well, God's kind of love does not behave itself unseemly. There are right and wrong things to do regardless of where you are, even if we, you're with your mate. And if you cannot control it, if it's controlling you, it's not God's kind of love. Now, I believe that this is important because, again, sometimes people will say, but I just love them. I can't stand to be apart from them. And because of that, they put all kinds of demands on the marriage. They put all kinds of demands on their mate. And they think they are justifying their actions thinking, but this is love. No, God's kind of love does not behave itself unseemly. It can be controlled. It will always operate in a fashion that will bring honor and glory to the Lord and to your mate. He goes on to say that God's kind of love does not seek her own. And you know, really, if you were to sum up everything that it's talking about God's kind of love, that really is the main thing, that it is not self-serving. It is not in it for what you can get, but rather God's kind of love is a giving, selfless love. The Bible says in James chapter, or excuse me, John chapter 3, verse 16, that God so loved the world that he gave. God loved us and he gave, not because he was at a deficit and he had to have us, but rather we had to have him. God's kind of love is a selfless type of love that is not seeking its own welfare, but is actually putting the welfare of somebody else above your own. And brothers and sisters, we could spend hours on that, but I encourage you to really pray and let God show you that until we get to that place, then we aren't operating in God's kind of love. He goes on to say that it is not easily provoked. Well, that right there nails a bunch of us because I guarantee you many of us, uh, it's just like, you know, the drop of a feather and I mean we explode. Somebody touches your hot button and immediately you can explode. That's not God's kind of love. If it's easy to have strife rise up between husband and wife, that is not God's kind of love. Again, I'm not saying these things to condemn. I'm saying them to open up our eyes that, brothers and sisters, we haven't really applied God's kind of love. We don't have a good understanding of it. We're operating in a human love that is just incapable of cementing people together in marriage. And we need to recognize and humble ourselves and say, God, teach me. God, show me your kind of love. It goes on to say here that it thinks no evil. And you know what this is really talking about? I looked this up in other translations. I looked it up in the Greek. And what it's really talking about is that God's kind of love will not dwell on the other person's wrongs, the mistakes, the things done to it. It won't dwell on the negative, but instead it will dwell on the positive. And again, I believe that our society has probably been geared, pushed towards the negative more than any other society that's ever existed. I mean, our news media doesn't report on the positive things. They report on all the negative things. They don't tell you the positive statistics. They tell you the negative statistics. We've been geared towards that. And sad to say, religion has picked up on the same thing, and religion has come along. And, I mean, sometimes in messages, we'll spend 40 minutes talking about how bad the world is getting and then spend five minutes saying, but Jesus is the answer. I don't care if you do say that Jesus is the answer. If you only spend five minutes talking about the answer and 40 minutes talking about the problem, people are going to go home burdened and weighted down with the problem. We become negative. And in our marriage, we do that so easily. It's so, easily to, it's so easy to recognize other people's problems and dwell on that and forget their good things. You know, I remember this one minister that I was listening to on a tape, and he was talking about this exact scripture and saying that he had gotten to a place to where he just literally wasn't seeing any good in his mate at all. And his mate, this wife, was a Christian. She was a spirit-filled Christian. And yet, he couldn't see any good in her at all. And he found himself one time in prayer just praying and talking about all of the problems, continually talking about the things that she wasn't doing. She wasn't seeking the Lord the way he thought she should be. She wasn't doing this and on and on and on. And in prayer, the Lord spoke to him and he says, you need to stop that and think on things that are honest, pure, lovely, of good report, things that have virtue and praise out of Philippians chapter 4. And so he told him that, and he said, every morning for the next two weeks, you just pick one thing that's positive about your wife. You refuse to think on anything negative. You pick one positive thing. And this man began to do that, and at the end of two weeks, he had found so many positive things about his wife that he literally had let go because he had focused in on the negative that he had to repent and say, God forgive him, because he really did have a godly wife. She wasn't perfect. She still had things that needed to change in her life. But he recognized that he had been gravitating towards the negative. You know, sometimes when people come to me for marriage,
And they're criticizing their mate. And I can see that maybe what they're saying about their mate is true because nobody's perfect. I don't care who you uh, put on a pedestal. I guarantee you, if you were married to them, you'd find some things wrong with them. And so I see these people criticizing their mate, and I can see that, yes, they've got problems, but it just to me is like they're, they're having to look over this mountain of godly things about them. I mean, most people would give uh, anything to trade places with them and have their problems. Now, I know that some of you listening to me may have serious problems in your marriage, but if you'd be honest, if you get into God's kind of love, you could find some positive things about your mate. There are some good things about your mate, and you need to start dwelling on those. You know, I found this out with my children, that there are times that I need to correct them directly and deal with the negatives in their life. But I found that if all I do is deal with them on negatives and constantly say, you're wrong here and you're wrong here and you're wrong here, it breaks their spirit, and it gets them to a place where they just don't want to try. I remember one instance with my youngest son, Peter, that he was working on some woodwork thing, and I told him to do it a certain way, and he, no, he knew better. He could do it his own way. He started doing it his own way, and yet he wound up having problems. And I, I came up and started saying, now, see, I told you if you would have done this, and what I was telling him was correct, but it was pointing out the negative. And at that time, instead of encouraging him to do it right, you know what it did? He just walked off and says, I can't do it. And I wound up having to repent, go talk to him and encourage him. And I found out that sometimes I need to deal with that, but the majority of the time, if there's 10 things wrong and one thing right, I need to see the good thing. I need to build him up and encourage him and tell him, boy, you can do that. And did you know if you would just straighten this out over here, you could even be better. There's a positive and a negative way to approach things. And brothers and sisters, Satan is a master at getting you to see the negative side of other people, especially your mate. And if you do that, you can develop an attitude towards a person that maybe has facts, but it is really distorted. You blow their mistakes out of proportion. And by dwelling on the negative, it forms an attitude within you that, that your mate picks up on, and it actually aggravates the situation. It does not make them better. It makes them worse. We need to get into God's kind of love to where... It thinks no evil. 
You know, when you first fall in love with a person, and I put that in quotes again because I don't believe it's always God's kind of love, but the initial experience of love, God's kind of love or even the world's kind of love, is that it just overlooks problems. You don't see those problems in people. Did you know that very few of you, your mate hasn't really changed since you got married? Now, they have to some degree, but basically those things are there. I remember one pastor that when he calls people in to counsel them about getting married, he, he has the woman look at the man and he says, do you like this man the way he is? Oh, I not only like him, I love him. And she just begins to start praising him. And then he turns to the man, do you like this woman the way she is? Oh, I love her. And he just builds her up. And then he says, all right, I want you all to remember that when you got them, they were okay. And years down the road, if you don't like them, remember that when you got them, they were okay. It's you that made them this way. And really, basically... If you're mate, they may change in some ways, but those basic things were there. And it's usually not the person that changes so much. It's our perception. The further you get away from that initial experience of love, you begin to start dwelling upon the negative, and it changes your attitude, your perception towards that person. When you first come in contact with them, when you first begin to fall in love with that person, you aren't focusing on the negative, and there was a totally different attitude. Now, I'll grant you that sometimes it's hard to overlook real serious problems and hurts. They need to be dealt with and they need to be resolved. But still, I'm making this point that God's kind of love thinks no evil. No evil. It does not gravitate towards the negative. It doesn't dwell on the negative. If Satan can get you to dwell on your mate's problems, I guarantee you he can make a good marriage bad any single day. And on the other hand, if you would begin to start seeing the positive things in your mate, you can make a bad marriage good just by your attitude, the love, the way you begin to honor and build up and esteem your mate. It goes on to say that God's kind of love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Did you know that I've seen people that the husband and wife have an argument, a disagreement about things, and, and then when, when uh, the other person fails and it turns out that they were right, they come along and then they actually rejoice to see their mate fail. Now, I know I'm not speaking to anybody like that, but, you know, I believe if you'd be honest, there's some of you that when you've seen your mate fail, you have a feeling in your heart like, man, they deserve it. They're getting what they deserve, and some of you are actually the agent that causes them to fail. Some of you are actually glorying in seeing your mate fail. Man, if that attitude is there, you cannot justify that. The world may justify it, but God's Word says that God's kind of love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. It doesn't rejoice when a person fails, but it rejoices to see your mate prosper. Brothers and sisters, we need to go back to God's kind of love. In verse 7, it says that God's kind of love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You know, that's an awesome statement. Again, when I deal with people in marriage, constantly people come and they tell me how negative the situation is and they say, you know, how much can I bear? You can't expect me. I mean, my, my endurance is not limitless. There has to be limits. Did you know that most people would agree with that? Most people would say, you're exactly right. I mean, God only expects you to go so far. But see, God's kind of love bears all things. When a person says, I can't bear it anymore, I've taken all I can endure, all they're saying is that they have reached the limit of their human ability. But see, again, I go back to teaching that we've already said, God didn't create marriage to operate in your own natural ability. He created it for a sinless man who was in union with God, had the life of God flowing through him. Marriage, the way God intended it to be, is not really going to work until you get plugged into God's life, into God's divine ability. And I'm speaking mainly to Christians, and Christians do have the love and the life of God in them. And when you say, I just can't bear it anymore, all you're saying is that you've been operating out of human ability, out of a human type of love. When you push over into God's kind of love, there are no limits on it. There is no situation facing you that is beyond God's ability. There is no situation facing you that is beyond your ability to bear it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says that there is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. You can bear it. God's kind of love bears all things. It says it believes all things. You know, I've had a lot of people come to me and say, well, at one time I was believing for this marriage, but it's just, I just can't believe anymore. It's too bad. Well, God's kind of love believes all things. If you've reached a place where you just cannot believe that your marriage is going to repair and increase and improve, then it means that you're operating out of a human type of love, not God's kind of love. God's kind of love believes all things. 
Galatians 5, 6 says, faith works by love. Faith is motivated, empowered by God's kind of love. And God's kind of love will cause you to believe for that marriage. If you've got a deficiency right now in believing for your marriage, if you can't bring yourself to believe for your mate, then it's not really a faith problem, it's a love problem. You need God's kind of love flowing in your life. It goes on to say that it hopes all things. And, you know, this is an area that I believe is critical in our society today. Our society actually plays down hope. They tell people, don't get your hopes up. Uh, people are afraid to hope. They just, again, gravitated towards the negative. They're pessimistic. They don't expect much. And because of it, they're getting exactly what they believe for, which is nothing. And many people come and say, but, you know, I just lost hope for my marriage. Well, that, anytime you feel that way, it ought to be a red flag to you that you are not operating in God's kind of love because when you're in God's kind of love, you can hope for that marriage. Hope is not the same as faith. It's actually the first step of faith. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you can't have hope for your marriage, you can't believe for your marriage. If you can't get a hope, a vision, a goal, a dream out there of seeing that marriage ever put together and operate the way God wants it to, then you'll never get into faith for that marriage. Hope is important. If your hope has been destroyed, if you have no hope, if the image that you actually see for your marriage is a negative image, nothing but problems, then you need God's kind of love to come flood into your life because God's kind of love will cause you to hope all things. And then the last thing I hear it says that God's kind of love endures all things. And again, I know that there's some of you that are just saying, you know, I can't endure any longer. I, I have reached my limits. Again, all you've done is reach the end of yourself, which actually is a very good place to be. That's a great place to be. Some of you that feel desperate right now and that your marriage is just beyond hope and you say, man, I can't endure any longer. I can't bear it. I can't believe. I've lost my hope for the thing. And you may feel desperate. Did you know actually you're in a good place? Because you are on a, you're on a fence right now and you're fixing to have to make a decision. Are you going to quit because you've reached the end of your limits and just give up? Or are you going to all of a sudden say, God, I can't do it. I need you. You know, if you're to that place to where, God, I've exhausted myself, I've exhausted all of my resources, and I've got to have you, your kind of love flowing through me to love this person, well, then that's really a very good place to be. And it's a shame that we have to come to that place through tragedy, through heartbreak, through sorrow, strife, whatever, but it's important when you get to that place, regardless of how you arrive, that you make the right decision. And there's some of you right now that need to make this decision, and instead of feeling hopeless, desperate, Instead of feeling like, God, I can't go on, what you need to do is to say, Father, thank you for this list right here. I realize that all that's been happening is I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to make this marriage work out of my own ability instead of out of your ability. God, I ask you right now to forgive me for trying and struggling so hard on my own, and I just want your love to flow through me. You know, some of you are trying to give away what you don't have. Some of you, it's possible, could take this list of things and say, well, God, I recognize this is the way I need to be, and you could just try and on your own self-will, love. But, you know, you can't give away what you don't have. Many of you right now need to humble yourself and you need to ask God to just fill you with the revelation of His love for you. Many of us, you know, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And the reason that we aren't operating in love and speaking in love and acting in love is because we really don't have a good revelation of love ourselves. We don't feel loved and secure on the inside, and so we wound up reproducing this mistake in our relationship with other people. You need to ask God today for a revelation of love because the last verse here, 1 Corinthians 13, 8, says, Charity, or God's kind of love, never fails. Now, that doesn't mean that you can guarantee your mate is going to change but it means that God's kind of love will never fail to work within you the ability to endure, be patient, be kind, not envy, not boast, not operate in pride, not behave yourself unseemly. It'll help you to...
things, bear all things, hope all things, endure all things. God's kind of love will never fail to produce in your life regardless of what your mate does. There is nothing that your mate's doing that is a justification for you being defeated and a failure in marriage. Now, you cannot totally control that other person, but you can totally control yourself with God's kind of love. And this checklist is just a proof of that. I don't want you to be condemned today, but I do want you to be convicted. And instead of looking to the other person and saying, God, what's wrong with them? God, when are they going to change? You need to humble yourself and say, God, forgive me. God, help me to operate in your kind of love. Right now, just ask God to give you a God kind of love for your mate. Ask God to reveal his love to you, and then ask God to help you to turn around and begin to love your mate. It's a process. But did you know that if you'll make that decision and head in that direction, I can tell you that today could be a difference in your life. Quit basing your love for that person upon their actions and just go to God's Word and say, God, you've given me your love. The Bible says so. Now I want it to operate. Teach me how to love. And if you'll do that, God will begin to flow in your life, and I tell you, miracles could happen. Brothers and sisters, God's kind of love is the only antidote to that self-centeredness. And I believe if you'll take this truth and apply it, it'll change your life. Praise the Lord. I know that today's teaching about God's kind of love ministered to you. And I'd like to share with you that we have a cassette tape. It's a 90-minute teacher on this exact subject. And it'll go into much more detail than what I was able to do. And this tape would be a blessing to you. I'd like to supply this tape to you free of charge. It's a gift to anybody who'll simply write in and request our tape offer, TF11. That's tape offer, TF11. Also, if you could give towards the finances of this ministry, then we'd appreciate it. That's the way that God meets our needs. But I want you to have this tape regardless of your ability to give. And so it will be sent to you regardless of how you respond to that. Remember to write in and request this tape on God's kind of love in marriage. It's our tape offer, TF11. That's tape offer, TF11. From the beautiful mountains of Colorado comes the Gospel Truth Broadcast with Andrew Womack. Andrew has been called by God to be a teacher to the body of Christ. For the past 22 years, Andrew has been teaching people how to walk in God's best and is presently broadcasting the Gospel daily on over 30 radio stations nationwide. Andrew has distributed over one and a quarter million cassette tapes free of charge and is currently producing monthly installments of a New Testament study Bible with an accompanying cassette commentary called Life for Today. For more information about the ministry or to request a free cassette tape of today's message, please write to Andrew Womack, Post Office Box 3333, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80934. And now with today's message, here is Andrew Womack. Praise the Lord. I'm Andrew Womack, and I welcome you to another Gospel Truth broadcast. Today, we are now on our eighth teaching in a series on the subject of marriage. And we've covered a lot of material. We've shared some things that if you've applied these truths in your life, I guarantee you it will transform your life and your marriage. We've talked about the purpose of marriage, the priority of marriage. We've talked about strife in marriage, what at what it is, how deadly it is, and mainly what causes it. And uh, amazingly enough, it's not your mate, it's not the other person that causes it, it's not what other people do to you, it's what's inside of us that makes us angry. And basically we dealt from Proverbs 13, 10 that it's pride that makes us angry. And the antidote to that self-centeredness, which is what pride is, the only effective antidote to that is God's kind of love. So for the last two sessions, we've been talking about God's kind of love, and we dealt out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where the scripture there gives a list of the characteristics of God's kind of love. 
And I encourage you to go back over that on a continual basis, not for the purpose of condemnation, saying, oh God, I've missed it, but rather for the purpose of identifying God's kind of love. It's different than what most of us have called love. And so we, we feel an emotion. We have what the world calls love. We try and apply that to our relationship. And when we don't see that work, well, then we say, well, I've already loved them, and that didn't work. That wasn't the answer. And so you feel like, well, maybe divorce, separation, whatever. But, you know, God's kind of love always works. And we've dealt with that out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I encourage you to go back over that. Today, I'd like to share something with you another characteristic of God's kind of love. And I believe that this is one of the most distinguishing characteristics that separates it from a worldly kind of love. Out of Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, this is talking about God's love for us, but we can apply this in a person in a marriage towards your mate because, see, it's not supposed to be our human love, not a natural love that we operate towards our mate with, but it's supposed to be a divine God kind of love. Marriage was created by God for a man in a sinless state who is in union with God, had the life of God flowing through him, and marriage was really intended to operate with God's life, God's love flowing through it. You cannot make a marriage a success if we don't apply God's kind of love to it. So here in Romans chapter 5 is a scripture that we use many times to share salvation with the person, but it, it just is talking about God's kind of love. Verse 8, it says, God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, one of the most amazing things, one of the most distinguishing characteristics of God's kind of love is that it is not based on a person's performance. You don't just love a person who is doing things that cause you to love them, but God's kind of love. He loved us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, brothers and sisters, that is an amazing, amazing fact about God's kind of love. And yet, if you'd be honest, most of us, when it comes to relationships with other people, and especially with your mate, we really do deal with people based on performance. And if you're doing that, I promise you, you are going to destroy your own marriage. It doesn't matter who you're married to. It doesn't matter how perfect they are. They aren't completely perfect. They haven't yet attained unto everything. And if you love them only the way that they deserve to be loved, then there's going to be a lot of times that you just treat them bad because that's what we deserve. Praise God that the Lord doesn't give us what we deserve. You know, I used to work in a photography studio. And I remember that uh, we'd have these people come in and they'd look at their proofs. And, and I remember these ladies that came in and they were looking at these proofs. And they really were pretty good pictures. But people just kind of go through this thing where, where they were looking at these proofs and they were saying, oh, you know, my hair wasn't right, this wasn't right, or so and so. And finally one of them says, well, this, this picture just doesn't do me justice. And I didn't have the nerve to say this, but what I wanted to say was, lady, you don't need justice. You need mercy. <laughs> Amen? And that's the way it is with us and God. We don't need justice. And your mate doesn't need justice. If you deal out justice, if you say, well, they don't deserve me loving them, look what they did. If that's your attitude, you're never going to operate in God's kind of love because none of us deserve God's kind of love. But see, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And there's going to have to be a lot of that in marriage if you ever make your marriage work. You cannot give that person what they deserve. Somehow or another, we've had this uh, sense of justice ground into us to where we feel like that we've got to punish. We've got to deal with people. We've got to, if they do something wrong, we can't just let it slide. They'll take advantage of us. Did you know that it's actually the opposite? When you defer judging a person, and giving them what they deserve. When you operate in God's kind of love, you are actually loosing God. When you let God's love flow th through you, you are loosing God on the scene. When you operate in justice and you speak against a person or you do something to retaliate every time they do something wrong, you are going to get nothing but what you can produce yourself. The Bible says out of James chapter 1, I believe it's verse 20, it says, "...the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God." Man's wrath never accomplishes God's end. And you need to get that settled in your mind. Sometimes we feel like, well, man, I need to give this person justice. They don't need to get by with what they said or what they did. I need to call their hand on it. I need to deal with them proportional to what they deserve. But remember that scripture out of James chapter 1, verse 20, that the wrath of man does not accomplish God's righteousness. You are not going to get a godly end out of that. 
When you start defending yourself and standing there and demanding your own way and dealing with the person based on their performance, you're going to get what you can produce. And even though you may produce more than I can, you'll never get the perfect results that God wants for your marriage. When you love a person unconditionally, not based on their performance, what you're doing is freeing that person. You're freeing that person with the love of God. God's love is flowing th towards them through you. And you'll actually help that person to change and become a new person. Look at a scripture over here in Titus chapter 2. This is also, or excuse me, Titus chapter 3. And this is also talking about God's kind of love. And it says in verse 4, But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior towards man appeared. And here it is defining the way that God's kind of love worked. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. God didn't save you because you were worth saving. God didn't save you because you uh, deserved it, because your actions measured up to it. God loved you and saved you because God is love. God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. The Lord saved us not by works of righteousness, which we've done, and brothers and sisters, to make our marriage work, to operate in God's kind of love, we've got to begin to start operating in a love that is not based on a person's performance. And I tell you, that is so hard to grab hold of. One reason that this is very hard for people to operate in this kind of love is, I, I mentioned this briefly on our last session, but most people have never received that kind of love personally, and so they can't turn around and give it. We could unplug right here and quit talking about marriage and just go to talking about your personal relationship with the Lord. And did you know that if you do not get that unconditional God's kind of love flowing in your life, if you don't get a revelation of that and make it something to where you just know for sure that God carries your picture in his wallet. <laughs> Man, I got a friend that says that all the time and it blesses me because he's got a revelation that God loves him, that he's special. <laughs>because he's somebody special it's because he believes what god's word says if you don't have a working revelation of that then you'll never be able to turn around and really share it with your mate so your relationship with your mate is not actually going to prosper higher than your relationship with god you need to let god's unconditional love become a foundational basic truth in your life that you are so full of that then you'll be able to turn around and love your mate if you're thinking that God deals with you based on your performance and every time you blow it, God withdraws from you, God won't bless you, God won't move in your life because you don't deserve it, if you think that way, you're going to wind up reproducing that exact thinking in your dealings with other people. You need to recognize that God's never had anybody who was qualified working for him yet and you aren't going to be the first one. God isn't moving in your life because you deserve to have him moving in your life. God's moving in your life by his mercy and by his grace. And that's the way that we need to deal with our mate. Did you know that a godly mate ought to be covering their, other, their mate's sins? They ought to be operating as a high priest and forgiving sins and blessing that person instead of holding that person's sins against them. Praise God, when the Lord forgave us, it says in Psalms chapter 103 that he removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. I mean, it is thrown in the sea of God's forgetfulness is what it says. God has totally forgiven and uh, forgotten those sins. And that's the way that you ought to be with your mate. In John chapter 8, we have an example 
of this where Jesus extended God's kind of love. It was an unconditional love to a woman who was taken in the very act of adultery. And in John chapter 8, we read the story where this woman had been caught by these scribes and Pharisees in the very act of adultery, and it doesn't explain this, but I really believe that these scribes and Pharisees had probably been uh, spying on this woman, set this whole situation up in an, in an effort to entrap Jesus. That was their motive. They didn't care about the woman. Instead, they were trying to entrap Jesus. And you know, people who resist God's love being unconditional, they will many times get much more into sin than the person that they're criticizing because they get into bitterness and all of these other kind of things. I know that in Galatians, you know, where the people were arguing whether a person had to be circumcised or not to become a Christian, uh, the scriptures there show that people from the Jews from Jerusalem snuck up there and began to spy on them privately to see if they were circumcised. And the actual sin that they were doing, going in and spying on these people, was worse than the sin they were accusing the people of. Legalism is a deadly sin that leads to other forms of bondage. And so we see here in John chapter 8 that these Jews set this woman up, caught her in the very act of adultery, brought her to Jesus, threw her down, and said in verse 5, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? You know, they thought they had Jesus in a no-win situation. If he condemned the woman and says, That's right, stone her to death the way that the Bible commanded, if he did that, well, then all of these people who had been responding to him because he was preaching an unconditional type of love. He was preaching mercy and forgiveness instead of harsh judgment the way that the uh, scribes and Pharisees were preaching. If he began to start condemning, then he'd lose the crowd, so they'd win. If he didn't condemn the woman, then they'd be able to turn around and condemn him because he didn't uphold the word of God. So they felt like they had him either way he went. And Jesus simply responded to them by saying down here in verse 7, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Now, Jesus did not approve of her sin. He didn't say that she wasn't sinless. He just simply said, who is just in condemning her? That same principle that Jesus spoke about, where he says in Matthew chapter 7, why do you try and cast a little tiny speck out of somebody else's eye when you have this huge beam coming out of your own eye? And that's what he was doing. And the scripture doesn't reveal to us what he was doing when he wrote on the ground with his finger, but this is my own personal opinion. I believe that he was scribbling down their sins that they possibly were guilty of that maybe nobody else knew. And he was showing that, hey, there's not a one of you that is uh, just in condemning her. You're just as guilty as she is. So these people were convicted by their own conscience. They got up and left one by one. And then Jesus turned to the woman, and in verse 10, he said, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? In other words, where did all of these guys go who were after your scalp? And he says, well, they're all gone. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus did not approve of her sin. He didn't say that she hadn't done anything wrong. He just simply extended an unconditional type of love towards the maid. And brothers and sisters, you know this has so many applications in our own marriage. When people come to me, they constantly begin to start saying, but look what they've done. And they, they throw up instances, sometimes 10, 15, 20 years back, of where that mate has done this or said this or done that. And I don't deny that those things exist. I guarantee you, if you're living with a person, they've rubbed you the wrong way sometime or another. And I don't care who they are. We've all sinned. We all come short of the glory of God. I agree that, yes, there are reasons why things get to us. But did you know God's kind of love will extend mercy towards that person? God's kind of love will enable you to love that person regardless of whether they deserve love or not. For a person who says, but I can't love, look what they've done. You haven't ever understood one of the basic truths of God's kind of love, that it is unconditional. It is not based on performance. And you've got to get that established in your mind. You've got to renew your mind with that and get out of this kind of love that only loves a person when they're worth loving. Brothers and sisters, if you only love a person that's worth loving, then you're going to wind up being divorced over and over and over again. And the only person you're going to be able to live with is yourself. And you actually won't be able to live with yourself because you aren't worth loving either. <laughs> Amen? That may rub somebody the wrong way. You may think, well, you don't know me. But see, it, none of us, none of us are worth loving. That's the reason that sometimes you get so down on yourself. We need an unconditional love. And you know, instead of when you start giving love unconditionally like this, our natural mind, our carnal mind will think, but if I do that, these people are going to run smooth over the top of me. What's going to stop them? 
What's going to restrain them? I mean, it's me demanding my rights. It's me pushing my way that, it, that just keeps them from intruding and taking advantage of me constantly. You know, that's not so. I've already referred to that scripture in James chapter 1, verse 20. The wrath of man does not produce God's righteousness. When you defend yourself, that's all you get is what you can do. But when you let God be the one that defends you, when you operate in love, when you flow in love, you're flowing in God. God is love, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. And when you flow in love, an unconditional God kind of love, you are flowing in God, and God will flow through you, and God's power will protect you and defend you. Out of Romans chapter 12, the scripture there talks about, avenge not yourselves, but defer and give place to wrath, because vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. I will repay. We need to trust God to deal with our mate and not take it upon ourselves to be the Holy Ghost. You know, you make a very poor Holy Ghost. The Bible says that the Holy Ghost is sent to convict us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. It's the Holy Ghost's job to deal with your mate and to straight them out. God told you to love, not to correct. God didn't tell you that you're responsible for straightening your mate out and making sure they understand all of their failures. Now, brothers and sisters, you may not have put it in this exact terminology, but we have thought those kind of things. This is the way we deal in relationships and especially in marriage. We think that it's our God-given right to point out our partner's mistakes, to deal with them. We can't expect, or we don't want our mate to expect to just carry on as usual as if nothing has happened when they've really done something wrong and it's offended us. But did you know that that's the way that Jesus has done? Jesus loved this woman taken in the very act of adultery. He didn't say she hadn't done anything. He was well aware of her sin, but he bore that sin. I'm not saying that God's ignoring sin. I'm saying that Jesus bore it. And brothers and sisters, when you deal with your mate in an unconditional way, it doesn't mean that you're ignoring the fact that they have sinned. It doesn't mean that you're ignoring the fact that there's been a real serious problem. But what it does mean is you're beginning to operate like God. And you're going to forgive that person instead of giving them what they deserve. You're going to deal with them in an unconditional type of love. And when you do that, you release God on the scene. You know, there was an instance with my youngest son, Peter, when he was only three years old. And uh, he was a slow uh, learner to talk. Uh, my first son, we had him talking when he was seven months old, and he never quit. And so when my second son came along, I thought, boy, don't push it. And we just let him go. And when he was three years old, he still wasn't saying very much. And finally, he got to where he just pointed and grunted and groaned all of the time. And uh, we made a decision, told him, said, Peter, from now on, you're going to have to talk or I'm not going to do it for you. I'm not going to go to these points and, and grunts. And uh, so we were coming out of a restroom, and this door was really hard to open. It had a real strong spring in it. And as we were coming out, Peter went up, grabbed the knob, began to pull on that door, and he didn't have enough strength to pull it. Finally put his foot up on the door and pushed on it, which, of course, didn't help at all. And then he got mad. He kicked the door. He grunted and groaned, looked up at me, you know, like, do something. And I knew exactly what he was wanting done. But I told him he had to talk, and I stood there, and I just told him, I said, Peter, you got to talk. Well, he wouldn't talk, and he wouldn't let go of the handle either. And so I just stood there and waited, and I said, until you let go, I can't open the door. And finally, out of desperation, he let go, and when he did, I reached down and opened it. And you know, when I did that, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, Andy, that's exactly the way I feel about you at times. He says, you've got that situation. You've got your hands wrapped around it so tight that if I was to try and get to it, I'd have to hurt you. I'd have to squeeze, you know, just like I'd have had to open that door. I'd have had to squeeze so hard that I'd have hurt Peter's hand. I had to wait until he let go before I could handle it. And God was saying that, you know, until we let go, until we let him take care of the problem, until we cast a care about it over upon him, he really cannot intervene in our behalf. And, you know, I've applied that in my life, and I've had people come out against me I've had people that have hated me, that have criticized me and done all kinds of things. And instead of me striking back on my own, I have just blessed those people. I've loved those people even to the point that I can go to them and act just exactly as if nothing's ever happened. At times, I've actually forgotten that something did happen and I had to have somebody remind me that something had happened and that was an explanation for their actions. I've operated in love towards them. And did you know I've seen invariably, one time four years later, but I've seen God come back in and because I didn't avenge myself God avenged me God began to work in that situation I just operated in an unconditional type of love and not only did it free God in that relationship to come in and work in the relationship but you know what in between before I saw God 
repair the relationship, it freed me. You know, when you hold bitterness in your heart, when you deal with the person based on their performance and say, well, until they repent, I can't love them, I can't treat them this way, did you, you aren't doing that person damage, really. Now, it does affect them, but the real person receiving damage from that is you. Bitterness destroys you. It hurts you. It hurts you more than it hurts anybody else. That strife in your life will literally eat you up. And there are some of you that feel justified in not loving because you say, but look what they've done. I want you to know that Jesus commended his love towards you and that while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. In Luke chapter 23, verse 24, the scripture there says that Jesus, hanging on the cross, looked down and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If Jesus could forgive the very people who were crucifying him, and I mean if anybody was ever guilty, if anybody was ever worthy of punishment and judgment and rejection based on their actions, it would have been those people who wrongfully crucified Jesus, who was sinless, who was pure, who was spotless, who had nothing wrong with him. And if Jesus could turn around and forgive that way, then we can do it. The scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, says, Be ye kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now that scripture shows us that what Jesus did was not something that you can't obtain to. It wasn't an example for somebody that was just out of touch with us, mere human beings. The scripture commands us to be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. Even as, in the same manner, in like manner, brothers and sisters, you can do it. And you know, the good news is that you've already got God's kind of love on the inside of you. Some of you may be listening to me and thinking, man, what you're talking about is something that I don't even have. I mean, I've never operated that way. You may not feel like you have it, but the Bible says in, James, in Romans chapter 5, just above that scripture I used in Romans 5, 8, I believe it's verse 5. It says that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. It also says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. God's already implanted His love on the inside of you. Now, whether you can feel it, whether you've ever experienced it, whether you've ever seen a manifestation of it in your life or not, does not do away with what God says. You do have God's love planted on the inside of you. And it's a matter of, first of all, recognizing that what you're operating in isn't God's kind of love. Then you make a decision and you say, God, help me to operate in your kind of love. And as you do, you begin to start releasing that through a renewing of your mind. But you've got to recognize that that God kind of love is there. Brothers and sisters, you can operate in God's love. You can love people unconditionally. For some of you, it's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a renewing of the mind, a complete change of the attitude, the way you've been dealt with and the way you've dealt with others all of your life. But nonetheless, that's the way that you're going to have to operate. God's kind of love is not based on a person's performance. It is not according to a person's actions. And I tell you, when you receive this, it'll set you free. It'll set you free from the bitterness, but you know what it'll also do? It'll mean that from now on, you can choose to operate in love. And what other people do cannot stop you. Now that's liberty. That's freedom. That's true victory. Sometimes Christians are looking for a place in the Lord where they can enter into that nobody will ever rub them the wrong way. They're believing that somehow or another they can enter into a position where problems don't come their way, where strife doesn't come their way. And they're just looking for some way to sidestep all of the problems of the world. Did you know that that's not what the Lord promised us? But the Lord did promise that he could change you. He could plant his love on the inside of you so that regardless of what other people do, it is not going to affect you. You can make a decision that regardless of what my mate does, they can't do anything bad enough to keep me from loving them. And some of you, when you can even consider that, fear rises up on the inside of you like, man, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe that that's possible. But with God, it is possible. These examples that we've used of Jesus, they show you that Jesus loved us even while we were yet sinners. He loved us and gave his love to us. You don't give love because you're going to get something back. A God kind of love gives without being self-serving without looking at what's in it for themselves, but you give because of the need of the other person. 
A God's kind of love doesn't give based on a person's performance, on their actions, but rather gives because it is your nature to love and to give. That's the way that God was with us. And brothers and sisters, that's the way God wants you to be with your mate and with other people. Again, I reiterate one of the points that I made that some of you may recognize this truth. You may say, well, that's, that's me. I need this. But what do I do? The first step is you need to humble yourself and ask God to give you a revelation of God's kind of love for yourself. You can't give what you don't have. You need to say, God, forgive me for thinking that you don't love me except when I deserve to be loved. God commended his love towards you and that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. And you need to humble yourself and say, Father, forgive me. I receive your unconditional love. Get in God's word. Study about God's unconditional type of love. Receive a revelation of that and then turn around and begin to give to your mate. When you do it, your mate may get worse instead of better. And I want to prepare you because what will happen, they'll be so shocked that at first they may test you and say, I don't believe this is real. This is just another kick that they're on, and they'll try you out. So it may look worse for a while, but I promise you, if you continue in it, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, God's kind of love never fails. That unconditional type of love will touch them and win them over. I'd like to offer you some additional teaching on this subject about God's kind of love. If you've been receiving what I said today, I guarantee you that this is more than what you can receive in just a little brief 30-minute teaching. I have a 90-minute cassette here talking about God's kind of love in marriage. And I'd like to give it to you as a gift. All you need to do is write in and request our tape offer, TF12. That's tape offer TF12, and we'll send it to you through the mail. If you can give a gift financially to help us, we'd appreciate it, but it is not mandatory for this tape. We want you to have this teaching. We also want you to help us because that's the way we continue these programs. So you pray about it and then give as you feel the Lord directs you. Remember when you write in to request this tape on God's kind of love in marriage, it's our tape offer TF12.